Thank you. Ms. Chase? We're going to go in the order we were sitting. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Menendez. Mr. Kane, thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss conditions in Afghanistan and the implications for U.S. policy. Just to remind you of my dual perspective, about eight years in downtown Kandahar and then serving for two com ISAFs and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Of course, judgments are my own. They got used to that, uh, most of them. Three topics dominate uh, Afghanistan debate. The security situation, and related to that, the size of a residual U.S. force, the 2014 election. Um, and though it hasn't really uh, been apparent here today, negotiations with the Taliban. In each case, I think eyes are fixed on the formal process, while the real meaning lies beneath that surface. What's missing is a political strategy within which the formalities might add up to something. At this point, I think that strategy must include a more broad-based reconciliation process that could set the stage for credible elections and a new approach to Pakistan. On elections, I'd really just like to second everything that you, Mr. Chairman, said and Ranking Member Corker. Um, sadly, what really matters in Afghan elections today is not votes, the ability to mobilize them, but who controls the process. So last weekend, the head of the Election Commission declared that parliamentary debate on the legislation mentioned by Ambassador Dobbins has dragged on for too long, and Karzai will just be enacting uh, regulations by decree. That's a really big issue. Also, uh, as I've mentioned here uh, previously, U.S. payments to the key political actor also matter. Here's my recommendation. If the U.S. government, and it's going to echo a lot of what's been said here today, if the U.S. government is going to lend the moral authority of this country to the 2014 election, then words like credible have to mean something. U.S. support for the vote, vote must be contingent on some standards. For example, an empowered elections commission whose members are not appointed by the president. If Mr. Karzai wants to run an election he can control, okay, but not on the U.S. dime and not on the democratic reputation of the United States. And I'm not sure that another ambassador in Kabul really would change these dynamics necessarily. It didn't in 2009. On security, again, a lot of talk has been devoted to the Afghan National Security Forces' tactical capabilities. There have been real improvements, though, as mentioned, uh, the ANSF casualty rate has spiked over any previous record. According to ISAF officials, at more than 40 casualties per 10,000 service members per month, which would be approximately a total of 1,200 killed and wounded per month, higher than today's Washington Post puts it. But the technical skills of Afghan soldiers are really beside the point. To echo Mr. Hadley, an army, in, a, in different words, an army, the best army, it's only a tool in the hands of a government. You can exercise it, take the arm to the gym and do exercises, lift some weights. But if the body to which that arm is attached is non-viable, then it's not going to be able to defend much. That's the substance that kept, keeps getting missed. On that and security in general, measures lack. ISAF stopped reporting violent statistics in March. They were disputable anyway, those statistics. So we're left with anecdotes. Uh, madrasa students in Pakistan are being sent into the fight uh, in large numbers this year. Taliban are attacking in larger groups than they have in years. Uh, but there have been improvements, improvements in Kandahar, for example, which is my own uh, experience. Afghan colleagues there can visit areas the Taliban controlled in 2009. The current police chief is keeping the Taliban at bay, but at such a cost in extrajudicial killing that he's turning much of the town against him. His name is Razik. I've known him for more than a decade, and this was to be expected. I warned General Petraeus when he was Com ISAF about this man's style and the potential Leahy Amendment uh, issues that it raises. Meanwhile, Northern Helmen, for example, uh, is reinfested with Taliban. A point often missed is that Taliban's strategy is to obtain the maximum policy impact for the minimum investment of resources. That's what asymmetric warfare is all about. So note the recent attacks. Um, the usefulness in that context of any assessment of current security trends for predicting outcomes is questionable. As for residual U.S. troops, I'm actually not sure that 10,000 would make much more of an impact on security and stability in Afghanistan than zero. My reading of the sing signals in this town is that zero 
is a pretty likely bet. And to be honest, in the absence of a policy framework within which the commitment and sacrifice would make sense, I'm finding it difficult to argue with that. So how to get to zero without leaving a black hole behind? How to get to zero responsibly, honoring the efforts and losses and preserving some potential for the Afghan people and for regional stability? Here's my recommendation. Don't look to security structures to provide security amidst political meltdown. The way to wind down U.S. involvement in Afghanistan without the place unraveling behind us is not to focus on military techni technicalities. It's to take a different approach to the political context. A single negotiating track with the Taliban leadership was never the right approach for a couple of reasons. The ISI involvement with Taliban leadership may be complex and fraught, but it is, it is effective, uh, as Ranking Member Corker raised earlier. It's likely that the ISI started recon reconstituting the Taliban in late 2002, and I watched them doing that precisely with negotiations in mind. They, like us, presumed an, an insurgency would end in negotiations, and they wanted to drive us there and then control the outcome. The ISI retains enough hold over Taliban leadership to choose who goes to Doha and what they settle for. Ironically, we've been practically begging Pakistani officials to play that role. In other words, we wouldn't be negotiating with autonomous representatives of an Afghan movement in Doha. We'd be talking to the ISI by proxy. That carries a couple of implications. It means we're effectively rewarding Pakistan for the deliberate use of violent proxies as an instrument of national policy. And it means the terms of any deal would likely be, be unacceptable to most Afghans because they'd be, sorry, because they'd entail surrendering too much sovereignty, which brings me to my next point. It's not just the Taliban who are opposed to the way the Karzai government's been operating, it's most Afghans are. But the others didn't take up arms. And yet those Afghans have no seat. We're in effect punishing the nonviolent opposition in our rush to placate the violent opposition. This approach doesn't line up with our values as a nation, and it's almost guaranteed not to work, but rather to lead to the next war. Here's my recommendation, two prongs. With respect to Afghan reconciliation, make it much more inclusive, like what the French tested late last year in Chantilly. Involve all the major constituencies, including the Taliban and members of the Karzai government. With respect to Pakistan, first, raise the cost of using violent proxies as an instrument of policy by an array of leverage and smart sanctions. Do not ask Pakistani officials to act as agents to help organize intra-Afghan talks. Second, open a proper state-to-state -state channel through which Pakistan can identify and address its legitimate strategic aspirations and concerns with respect to its neighbor. Mr. Chairman, I really think only such a change in our political approach can offer a way to conclude military involvement in Afghanistan without leaving the region more dangerous than we found it in 2001. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Derry.